Okay, now we are moving on into the next lecture with Rudolf Steiner and his karmic lectures. And we're going to go over the past lives of three men here, two of them very obscure. They have fallen into complete ob obscurity. And at first I was hesitant to uh, go through them, but I think the fact is that uh, they're so interesting, and it's so interesting the way Steiner goes through this that it's, it's irresistible that we have to talk about them. So this is uh, Friedrich Theodor Fischer, who was born in 1807 and died in 1887. And um, he was an aesthetician. There's nothing really original about him because he was a Hegelian. He simply spoke in Hegelese. Um, and he wrote a five-volume work on aesthetics in which he took the point of view basically that the idea uh, is beauty, or let's say beauty is the idea in material form. And the book is full of those kinds of Hegelian statements and points of view that are still steeped with a certain amount of divinity. As everyone knows, Hegel was thoroughly uh, religious and a Christian. That point is very important. Um, then what this guy did, interestingly, was after he creates this five-volume, uh, I don't think anyone's going to call it a masterpiece, but or because there was nothing original about it. But then he, he went back as a, as a critic, because he was primarily a cultural critic, and tore it apart uh, as though he were his own worst enemy. I think this was like 10 or 15 years later. Um, he goes back and he writes, uh, this is all wrong, uh, that's all wrong, and just tears it apart um, and begins to turn away from uh, spirituality into a more uh, materialistic point of view. Um, so those are the salient facts about this guy. Um, now, uh, so as far as his past lives go, um, Steiner only reviews one of them. And so apparently he was an Arab in uh, the time of Charlemagne, r right around 750, um, in Sicily. So he was one of the guys who crossed over uh, I guess from North Africa into Sicily, and he was an Arab, um, and uh, he he was thoroughly steeped in North African culture, and uh, he had many Arabic companions. Uh, they were all f friends, uh, but he in particular had a certain admiration for the Northerners. I guess the the Italians uh, coming across down into Sicily, he had a certain admiration for them. Um, and so Steiner doesn't say that much about that particular life. What's important is what happens in between. After he dies and goes into the world between death and, an, and another birth, he's there for many centuries, all the way down until 1807, when he was born in the 19th century. He was there, and he was also there with his Arabic companions, as happens normally, uh, when one goes to the other side, one uh, normally consorts with one's tribe, let's say, who, with whom one is incarnating over and over again. And their task was to, pre to uh, pre preserve a certain non-Christian strain. The fact that they had been Arabs was part of that. Um, but it was important to preserve, an, not an anti-Christian strain, but a non-Christian strain that will then develop in the 19th century into materialism, uh, um, which Steiner regards as anti-Christian. Um, so he then incarnates in 1807. Um, he writes his book. Uh, he's a Hegelian, and Hegel is, of course, a big Christian, believes in God. God, for him, is the absolute. Everything is the manifestation of God's ideas working through history. Um, so he writes the five-volume treatise, which is a deflection of his karma, because his karma is supposed to preserve a non-Christian stream. That was the agreement he had with his Arabic companions um, before they incarnated, which is why, Steiner says, when he went back later and uh, criticized his work and destroyed it, he got back on track with his karma, which was to preserve a non-Christian tradition, um, which is why he destroyed his own five-volume work on aesthetics to prepare for the group of his other Arabic companions who would incarnate in the 19th century as uh, materialists and mechanists. 
So he was born out of that group first, before them, um, which is why he starts out as a Hegelian uh, and then gradually converts to a kind of almost a nihilistic uh, worldview, uh, thus paving the way for the coming of the materialistic strain, which Steiner regards as anti-Christian. So that's uh, Theodore Fisher, which I think is fascinating. Um, so now let's look at uh, the great composer Franz Schubert. Here he is, one of the greatest composers of the uh, 19th century. Um, his dates are 1797 to 1828. He lived a very short life. He died at the age of 31, uh, but he wrote all kinds of compositions. And he had a friend, a patron named uh, Baron von Spahn. This is him, who was eight years older than he, who was a, a kind of a lifelong friend of his. But more importantly, he, was, uh, he had money. And Schubert was poor all of his life. Uh, let's go back to Schubert here. He was he was poor all of his life, um, but this guy uh, took him in and very often let him sleep on his couch, um, gave him money, uh, kind of like the relationship between Marx and Engels, gave him money and basically was his patron and allowed him to get by and witnessed how Schubert would do his compositions every morning. He would, they'd drink, they were drinking buddies at night, uh, then they would go to bed, Schubert would wake up the next morning and he would write his beautiful compositions like the Winterreise uh, or the Earl Kernich and uh, sit at the table there. That's probably a portrait of him in the morning, uh, which is how he would do his compositions. And nobody knew who the fuck he was. Um, he was totally obscure his entire life and he was not appreciated until he died. And it seems like the moment that he died, uh, suddenly everybody loved him and started digging up all of his compositions and pulling them out. Um, and um, so that was sort of Schubert's uh, situation. Uh, now, back in their past lives, the past lives of Schubert and von Spahn, they had a relationship uh, in Spain in which von Spahn was the Prince of Castile, or a prince of Castile, um, who was at war with the Moors at that time. And Schubert was uh, actually a Moor, a very learned, educated Moor, who had inherited African culture uh, and was studying astrology and astronomy uh, and all this stuff coming up through North Africa into Spain. And what happened was that um, the Moors chased von Spahn out, the prince of Castile. He, he got chased out of his castle. And he had nowhere to go, but Schubert, as a Moor, took him in. Uh, took him in and cared for him. And uh, basically, um, as an act of gratitude, when they reincarnated, that is the reason why von Spahn became his patron. Um, that's how karma works. Um, it, it just that, That's the law of karmic balancing. Um, he owed him a, for, a favor, so he had to repay it when they reincarnated uh, later on. And so I find that very interesting. And Schubert had a temper, uh, Steiner says. Uh, he was a very quiet guy normally, but every now and then he would get into a dispute at a tavern and just stand up and start roaring at, at someone. And um, so um, Steiner thinks he would have been just a brawler, a bar brawler, if he hadn't had this aesthetic talent for creating such beautiful music. And... He thinks that the temper comes from the fact that when he was a Moor, he was involved in the wars, uh, and he had to be very fierce. He had to be a, a fierce fighter. Um, so that's the; those are the incarnations of uh, von Spahn and uh, Schubert. Now let's look at this very obscure guy. I hope he hasn't slid off here. This very obscure guy, Eugene During, who was born in 1833, and died in 1921, uh, and he was a pure materialist mechanist now. So he's one of the guys that the incarnation of Fisher uh, paved the way for, uh, a total mechanist, materialist. But, it, but Steiner read all of his books. Apparently Steiner was just absolutely, in spite of Steiner being so spiritual, was just absolutely 
mesmerized by his mathematical books and his books on physics and his book on uh, Robert Julius uh, Meyer, the guy who created the first law of thermodynamics. Um, Steiner just loved his worldview and thought that even even though it was materialist mechanist, it still had a certain kind of intellectual spirituality about it that separated him from the other mechanist materialists of the time, separated him from the herd. And so when Steiner looked back at his past lives, he saw two of them. Um, and one of them was uh, the fact that he was a part of the Greek iconoclast controversy uh, in the 8th century. That started in 726 AD um, under uh Constantine V, who put a ban on images. Um, now, originally, for the first couple of centuries, Christianity had no images because it came out of an iconoclastic tradition. Thou shalt make no graven images of anything uh, in the earth or the sky, and certainly not of me, Yahweh, the mighty Yahweh. Um, so Christianity in initially continued with that um, iconoclasm, but pretty soon images began appearing uh, in the catacombs, where Christian art basically began, in funerary rites, uh, inside churches, the images started to appear. Um, but in Constantinople, by the 8th century, um, they put, the emperor put a ban on images because the iconoclasts, and Eugene During was one of them. He was an iconoclast um, who... By the way, I missed an important detail in his incarnation in the 19th century. He went blind, uh, which is related to this iconoclasm here, this destruction of images. And the controversy was that um, painting images of the, the divine beings, of, of Christ, is tantamount to the hubris of separating uh, Christ's human and divine nature. You're separating them. And so you you're painting only his human nature and separating them is a, is a blasphemy. Really only the Eucharist is the true image of Christ because it is both divine and human. It contains within it the united nature of Christ uh, within it, whereas the paintings do not. So that was the argument of the iconoclasts. And there may have been some influence from Islam coming in there, I suspect. Islam preserved the iconoclastic, the iconoclastic tradition uh, of the Old Testament. And then so uh, the iconophiles, though, then said, well, actually, we're not presuming uh, to paint some sort of image of God or Christ. Uh, the, we're interested in the pedagogical aspects of these images. They can teach the illiterate, the people who can't read, can see the images of what happened. And the fact is that by the fact that God made himself as an invisible being, visible as Christ, that put an annulment on the Old Testament ban on images. So actually, it's a heresy to say that the Eucharist is the true image of uh, Christ. Um, that's a heresy. That's the real blasphemy. Um, God made himself visible to man for a reason, and this is why we paint him. Um, and so Eugene During was one of these iconoclasts, which Steiner thinks is related to his blindness, uh, which, came on, which came later, and the fact that materialism is a kind of form of blindness. You're not seeing the spiritual world. It's as though the spiritual world does not exist for you. Um, so it is, there is a kind of blindness to it. And another incarnation that Steiner saw uh, was that Eugene During was a Stoic in the 3rd century BC. He was a Stoic philosopher, and Stoicism, as is well known, uh, is, was a form of nihilism. Stoic ataraxia uh, was almost equivalent to Buddhist nirvana, um, and they weren't interested in anything worldly. Uh, it was also iconoclastic and nihilistic. So that's this guy's tradition. Um, those are his incarnations. Um, and in, this, is, this is what sheds light both on the fact that he became blind and the fact that as a mechanist materialist, he was blind to the spiritual world. So we'll leave it there uh, for that video. Uh, and the first of Steiner's uh, digging into the past lives.
of famous Europeans. 